happy unit of time and welcome back to deconstructive criticism or deconstruktiv kritik as we say in Swedish. Uh, this episode is launched on what happens to be Sweden's national day. So congratulations Sweden. It's the 6th of June 2018. I thought this the perfect day to interview and release the episode with Danish comedian and TV host Jonathan Spang, very famous in Denmark. Jonathan was pretty much unheard of in Sweden up until a few months ago when one of his comedy sketches parodying the relationship between Sweden and Denmark went viral in Sweden. In Denmark, he has been a face in comedy for more than 20 years and his TV show on Danish state television has been compared to Jon Stewart's Daily Show. In other words, he has a half-hour television program that does political satire or satirizes the news. Besides, and apart from that, he has done several stand-up shows, theater, film and TV. Sweden and Denmark, once bitter rivals for the kingship of the north, excuse me if that sounds like a complete season of Game of Thrones, but it pretty much used to be that way around these parts a few hundred years ago. But before Sweden and Denmark made friends in the early 1800s, the rivalry has been long forgotten, at least the violent rivalry between our nations. Most of the time nowadays our two countries seem to ignore each other. But in Jonathan's show about the situation in Sweden, one could discern a genuinely worried tone. The sketch made Jonathan so big that our biggest debate show on Swedish state television invited him to explain himself. What happened was they put him on via Skype at the very end of the show where he was cut off by technical difficulties and then the credits rolled so he was unable to do what he had in fact been invited to do which is explain himself and offer to help us Swedes in our confused state of mind some Danish directness or as Jonathan called it in the show comedic martial help. So, with your help, my dear Patreon or Swish supporter, I went to Denmark by plane to interview Jonathan. So, thank you so much for your support. Thanks to you, I can try to repair some of the shame and scorn our elected officials and state media provoke in peaceful neighboring countries. At first, I tried hard to save your money and do the interview via Skype, but for some reason, Jonathan no longer trusts Swedish media outlets when they ask for Skype interviews. Go figure. And what better day to publish a talk about the Swedish-Danish relationship than National Day of Sweden? And I quote from the National Day of Sweden's homepage, The National Day of Sweden, Swedes celebrate their National Day on 6th of June in honor of two historical events, Gustav Vasa being elected king 6th of June 1523, and the adoption of a new constitution on 6th of June 1809. This day offers a rare chance to see Swedes waving the flag. End quotation. You would think that we Swedes have been celebrating on this day for hundreds of years. And if you thought that, you would be wrong. It was instituted as our national holiday only a few years ago. In reality, most Swedes quietly think that the real national holiday is midsummers. But because of its old heathen roots, it was probably deemed politically incorrect or exclusionary to non-Norse pantheon adherents or something. And now instead, we have the 6th of June, which no one has any relationship to whatsoever. If you see anybody waving a flag in Sweden on the 6th of June, it's probably a confused immigrant who hasn't quite grasped that in Sweden we deny our nationality in absurdum out of fear that someone will remember its real roots, which we don't talk about because they were Nazi. Uh, I also want to warn you that I didn't really know how to approach this interview. I didn't know if I went as a comedian to another comedian and thus should attempt to be as funny as possible, or if I should go as a sort of serious person and just ask this comedian, a political satirist, at that, what he finds so easy about making fun of my country. Not that I don't know, and see, that's the problem right there, that I'm trying to do that job right here in Sweden, where it is a tad bit harder because of consensus culture and mob mentality. What is easy to see clearly from Denmark seems impossible to discern even the outline of in the foggy intellectual climate of Sweden. But before I introduce Jonathan, I briefly want to talk about comedy. 
Rumors I've been hearing lately from my own little subculture of comedy here in Sweden seems to hint at me not being a comedian at all anymore, but rather a political activist. Ironic, uh, I think, since most of my colleagues here in Sweden, the same people now trying to freeze me out, have gotten rich by doing comedy for the state in reality, political propaganda, while I have been censored and frozen out. Fortunately, I have some purely comedic projects ready for launch to counter these false claims. Projects that have been dragging on for more than five years are now finally coming to fruition. Specifically, comedy sketches of the superhero parody variety. I've always been fascinated with superheroes and many years ago I had this idea to do superheroes in therapy sketches, uh, which at the time I thought was original. And after four years and a lot of labor and swish money for my comedy special Groin or Schön in Swedish, I had finally filmed three of the sketches with a fantastic crew, great actors and everything was set and then Conan O'Brien released his skits with superheroes in therapy. Admittedly, not the same superheroes and not as good as mine, but since the therapist was played by Jeff Goldblum, it was close enough to be kind of embarrassing. And since then, that specific theme has become a hashtag on YouTube, with lots of takes on it. Uh, So I thought, why not put in the extra money to get it graded and sound produced, and now, finally, five years or more after its conception, it's ready to be launched upon the world. So you should keep a lookout for hashtag supertherapy or hashtag superheroes in therapy, because mine will break the hashtag. I know full well that it is ridiculous to put in that much time and effort and money, your money, into what amounts to less than 10 minutes of film, but my stupidity one out in the end and I will present to you super therapy by the end of June. So if you are a person who switched me for Schoen or Groin in 2015, 2015, anyway, thank you. The three superhero sketches I promised you are coming out, featuring the talented Joel Spira as Arachnoboy, the lovely Sir Andrew Lowry, who's not a real sir nor from England at all, who you might remember from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the original feature film of the TV series, as the captain and Mamut Suvakci as the Green Giant. I hope you will enjoy them. Unlike this podcast, you can share them openly without risking social suicide. And hopefully my colleagues might remember that I'm still a comedian while they are still political activists paid by the state. And if you don't support this podcast but want to, you can always become a Patreon at www.patreon.com. Just search for my name, that is Aaron Flam, Aaron with one A and Flam with one M, and then you can donate as much or as little as you want. The amount will only be drawn if I publish an episode. The same goes for Swish, so if you want to, Swish me, the number is 076-894-3737. 076-894-3737 eller på svenska 0768-943737 0768-943737 And if you're really brave you can go into my website www.aronflam.com slash merchandise and buy a t-shirt with the message Krossa Socialismen which means crush socialism printed on the front and socialism är ondska hjärta which means socialism is evil heart emoji. The heart emoji is there to remind us that we only want to crush the ideology, not the socialists themselves. Them we will save from their false Marxist consciousness. So buy a t-shirt, be a capitalist hero. Every purchase is a capitalist act. So go in on www.aronflam.com slash merchandise. Thank you for supporting me and Deconstructive Criticism so that I could fly down to Copenhagen to interview Denmark's own John Stewart, an extremely funny as well as thoughtful guy. Lady or gentleman, I give you Jonathan Spang. Enjoy. I should introduce you. You are Jonathan Spang. Yes. Uh, you are the John Stewart of Danish state television. Uh, you're not going to make me say yes to that, but but uh, I thank you. Okay, John Oliver then. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, do, I, do, have... I do a similar show uh, to, to John Oliver, yeah, uh, once a week, uh, talk about the news in, in Denmark, uh, mostly about politics and how the media handles it. And and, so, and it's called Tet Posand Hidden. Yeah. Which means? Close to the truth. 
All right, that's a good name. See, I, I told you, I don't understand your language okay. one bit. <laughs> okay, okay. I thought it was a name, and then you were close mm. to something. Oh, but now no. when you say it slowly, I understand. Sun, Hill. truthness. Sun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So it's quite similar then. Yeah. But um, and you've been doing this for how long? Uh, uh, a year now, two seasons. Um, uh, so I've been doing like twenty episodes, and then a New Year's special. Um, okay. And how did you get started? Um, I was doing another show, uh, which was like a, a, a sort of a, a sitcom. Um, and it was on a channel called TV2 Zulu in, it's, a, it's a Danish channel that has sort of um, I can say this it has the, the problem that a lot of uh, TV stations has today that they're losing uh, their viewers uh, and it's because they sort of years back it was like the channel for the young people mm -hmm. and now all the young people are either grown up or they are uh, watching YouTube. Yes. Um, but so I did this show, uh, not a lot of people saw it, but uh, the people on uh, Demos Radio, uh, Channel 2, where we do the show now, um, they liked it a lot and they were um, sort of not happy that the show wasn't on their uh, channel because it wasn't uh, really for young people at all. It was about me and my life. So and you're close to forty now. We're yeah, born in the I, I same year. Yeah, all right. Congratulations. Yeah, because you're born in February. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I looked you up on Wikipedia. Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yes. And then, uh, so I talked to the 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 boss of the channel. What would you say? The, uh, well, can, can yeah, that would, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and and we talked about uh, he he wanted me to 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 do something for them, and at that point I was like, no, because I'm gonna do this show that nobody watches forever, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, it was cancelled. <laughs> so I was back to him and said, let's do something, and what I really wanted to do was this week by week thing, and we talked about it, and for six months. Uh, uh, I sort of tried to develop it and, and uh, we did a lot of uh, dummy uh, shoots just with one camera and just uh, a laptop yeah. uh, showing the clips and, and um, to, to sort of try and get it right um, because I know how uh, how hard it is once you're, you're on the air uh, to adjust yes. anything. Yeah. Uh, so we needed to make a lot of mistakes before we started uh, airing. Uh, so, so I, I did that for for about uh, six months, uh, um, mostly with uh, just the the guy that I uh, have the the company. I own the company with the, another guy. He's not here right now, but Michael. Um, so uh, he would just uh, he would just sit and you know uh, show the, the the graphics and the clips on on the laptop. We did it at a small place uh, with about seventy people or so. Because you're as I am, a stand-up comedian yeah. at heart. Yeah. You started in 1998. Yes. And true. you won an amateur competition the first thing you did. Yeah. And then you got into acting school. Yeah. Royal Danish acting school. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I started a bit later than you. Okay. I started in 2007, but okay. I also won our amateur championship, mm -hmm. yeah. which awarded me nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I actually won... Like a tour with Casper Christensen, who was like, you know, my childhood idol. And it hasn't happened yet. I'm still <laughs> waiting for it. But this was in 98. Yeah, no, it was in 99. But this was like the prize. This was what you won. But uh, apparently... Is he still alive? He's still alive. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and uh, if he listens, I'm still waiting for <laughs> the call. To deconstructive criticism. Yeah. That's a long shot, my friend. <laughs> so, but why did you want to... I mean, so you got your show cancelled, but... Have you done political satire on stage as well? Or? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, the latest uh, live show I did was called uh, Denmark, and was about um, I think it had five or seven main like issues with uh, the way we constructed uh, our society, and that was like the show. The show was like I started by saying these are like the seven. I think it was seven points that we need to go through, mm -hmm. and uh, once that is done. Uh, you know, 
it's over. And then <laughs> I talked for like one and a half hours about uh, these things in, in, um, and it doesn't sound uh, funny, but, but it, it, it was. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you are, after all, quite successful in a country known for its directness, at least oh, yeah. uh, in relation to its northern neighbor, Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how I discovered you, because you appeared on uh, Swedish Opinion Live, yeah, yeah. which is a debate show we have, our mm -hmm. biggest debate show on, okay. on state-sponsored television, yes. because you had made a very funny comedy sketch mm -hmm. uh, on the theme of Bron, which is the bridge, basically, in English, which... Um, there's a bridge between Denmark and Sweden mm -hmm. and um, there's a cop show there's been a cop show uh, about crimes happening uh, in between our countries where police have to work together with well in your case Swedes and in my case Danes mm -hmm. not that any of us have been on the show or our police officers in real life but uh, and and you were taken in sort of as a comic relief at the end, and you said something about you wanting wanting to send a humoristic martial help to Sweden. Yeah. And and then they cut you off. Yeah, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so I checked out your sketch, and it was super funny. And then I tried to look through your material on YouTube, but mm -hmm. my Danish is too poor. I don't yeah, understand yeah. shit. But someone has translated at least a Swedish show. Into yeah. with English subtitles and put it online. Yeah. So some uh, right wing Nazi, probably. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, it it seems that way. I was I was sort of um, I was a little confused because uh, one of the translations that I ran into uh, was based Danish comedian done a funny skit something you know, and I was like, it must be Danish based comedian. Did, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes, and I do not know. based Danish community. And then somebody explained to me, no, based it means that you're right wing. I was like, what? <laughs> well, not exactly. It oh. means that you're grounded. Oh, that you have both your feet on the planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. are not flying away in some sort of ideological ecstasy to the okay. land of. Uh, Trans lesbianism or mm -hmm. uh, Islamic relief or okay. So. Uh, that is, I, but I, I guess uh, the right wingers do use the expression more than I've heard from the left side, yeah. at least in Swedish politics. Okay. Uh, so, but you're a socialist. I have it on paper, Jonathan. I looked through your Danish papers online, and someone on first of May. I thought uh, I think it was first of May. Arbeid yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Some yeah. paper had called you, and how 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 are you with socialism? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. I I don't know. I, I think I'm undecided at this point. Uh, I've been I've been more left wing than I am now. I I don't know. I don't really feel. Uh, I'm not a member of any party, and has never been. Um, and I feel sort of homeless uh, as far as political parties uh, go in Denmark um, so I wouldn't call myself a socialist but but you know it's true that uh, this conservative paper called me up on the 1st of May which is like our um, international workers day where uh, workers get the day off and, and meet and talk about being a worker basically as far as that still we At still last. have that in Sweden. Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've actually, uh, this, the theme of this year's podcast, mm -hmm. uh, Deconstructive Criticism, is crush socialism. What? Crush socialism. Okay, to crush it. Crush, yes. So that's your mission? That was, uh, that is my mission, and I'm, uh, I might add, hugely successful at it. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I definitely now I realize I should have heard the, the podcast. <laughs> um, well, the thing is this. So I'm a comedian just like you. Yeah. And uh, I've been trying to make, do comedy in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And Sweden uh, suffers from a slight PC problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah. And I think this is due to the fact that Swedes are collectivist in nature. Yeah. Uh, very collectivist in nature. Uh, and I think that uh, the marriage between this original collectivism and socialism, a mm -hmm. hundred years down the line, yeah. has led to so much groupthink in so many areas mm -hmm. that 
uh, we need to crush socialism. And the, oh. uh, the reason why I chose that, because yeah. that's the biggest taboo you can break in Sweden, is yeah. to say crush socialism. Mm-hmm. I mean, they parade every 1st of May, mm-hmm. the socialists, um, yeah. with signs that says crush imperialism, crush United States, oh, crush okay. uh, capitalism. Yeah. Uh, so they don't really notice how hard this language is no, until no. you put socialism after the word crush. Ah, interesting. Yeah, and and uh, since then, my life has been hell. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, so people take that very seriously. Very seriously, yes. But that's uh, the reason why I wanted to come here and talk to you, because you made an entire episode of your second season mm-hmm, about yeah. Sweden, yeah. where you wanted to help us. Yes. Yes, and I heeded the call. Yeah, I mean, you, you went into black and white, you took up an old radio mic, you looked yes. into the camera and you said, Sweden, Sweden, this is free country Denmark calling. Yeah. Yes. So I crawled out of my bunker yeah. and got and, on the and plane. And we're here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great. <laughs> so, come I on, think give it to a, me. Uh, Where's <laughs> my martial help? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. That's hard. I mean, I, I think... I think that w- what what I was uh, what, what we're trying to to say with, the, with this thing in the show is that there are examples uh, where just from a Danish point of view, it just seems absurd how the debate is in Sweden. You exemplified in the show. Would you like yeah. to t- t- tell tell me about the example you brought up? Yeah, the, the first example we had in the show was Peter Springer, uh, the the now very famous Swedish policeman uh, who talked about uh, his experience with the you know the the, the connection between uh, group rape and uh, and immigration. Yes, which was like he was shamed, like sort of uh, in the public uh, debate, um, and then later on, actually some. Uh, statistics got out that showed that there was uh, very much a connection between the two. Yes. Um, and and this is of course absurd from a comedy point of view. I mean, so as a comedian, I look for the hypocrisy and uh, I I try to show that with the the humor. That's also what we uh, do with the 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 parody of the uh, poem. Yeah. That you talk about. Um, but the question, what is the martial help? That's of course uh, very hard for me. To no, because I agree with you. We yeah. need it, like really seriously need it. Uh, because and I think what, 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 what's important is maybe that when you have an outside perspective, when you look at Sweden from the outside, you see something else than when you're uh, inside Sweden. I, I, I think there's an important point uh, that, that that differentiates Swedes from Danes is that in in my experience, a lot of Swedish people have an enormous belief in um, the system, uh, not just their politicians, but the entire system. That that when somebody says we're going to handle this, this is going to be all right. That people actually believe that. Where I find that most Danish people believe very little in the system. I mean, we sort of use a lot of our time ridiculing the system talking about how the system doesn't work, this, then, then I went to the post office and this and that shit happened and this doesn't work. And, and, and my experience is that, not that this is better, but that, that we don't have the same um, belief in authorities. Like that. No, I I think you're quite right. Uh, Swedes believe in the, their system to a I would say worrying degree, mm. uh, and and I think that has worked out well for Sweden for at least yeah, you know, the last hundred years. But now it's starting to fail the system, mm. and no yeah. one knows how to fix things themselves anymore because no, you know no. the system the is going to fix it. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we're pretty much fucked. As you put it in your show, yeah. Uh, so I really liked uh, the first sketch I saw, the mm-hmm. the Bruin sketch, where you when you come over and you have a murder wict- victim, mm-hmm. and and you're asking about the assailant and the Swedish cop, your uh, the female Swedish cop, mm-hmm. she just uh, basically says, well, it's a person. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And you're like, but is it a he or a she? Is it mm-hmm. dark or light? Is it yeah? Yeah. Uh, and she goes, it's just a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. But but I think it's but, uh, important to to see that also the Danish cop is also a parody. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. Of, I mean, of a Dane. So, yeah, of a Dane. Okay, so let's go through. What are, what are the stereotypes uh, from Danes to Swedes and Swedes to Danes? Yeah, the stereotype of the Dane is that we're sort of like the hillbillies of Scandinavia. I mean, that that uh, that we're in the opposite part of the, the PC uh, uh, process. I mean, that that he... He the the Danish cop uh, talks, you know. He's very, uh, you know, he's smoking and talking very poorly about women and stuff like that. That's yes. like, and that's the stereotypical Dane. I think a lot of the uh, right wing folks who um, shared the 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 clip missed that point. Uh, maybe I, th- I I think, but I, I, I yeah, or maybe they just uh, uh, see Danes that way. Yeah, and, yeah, and thought yeah, you were the, fucking yeah. spot on because mm. I sort of felt you were spot on with both the Dane and the Sweden. And I've always had this feeling, not on an individual level, of course, but that Swedish culture and Danish culture they sort of define themselves in opposition to yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah, I so, find that too. Yeah, so Danes are freer and more direct, and Swedes are like very demure and, and uh, shut in. Mm. And and, and extremely undirect. Yeah, but but also very trustworthy. I mean, I feel that that's like a stereotype. I think that if you have like a deal with the Swede, I mean, this is going to be okay. You know, we you made really? this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We made this uh, agreement with IKEA, so it's. I mean, it's not like. If, if you order something, yeah, but, if you but, but you also made a deal, or didn't you have a deal with Sweden? You know, around nineteen forty something. What happened with that? Well, another Germanic tribe sort of oh, walked yeah. across your territory. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. Uh, there's but no. Th- that wasn't the Swedes' fault. No, but I, I, I don't know. Didn't we have like a deal to help you guys out? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I see. What you're... <laughs> I see where you're getting at. So, I mean, when it comes to military alliances, mm, I yeah, mean, okay, uh, Sweden course. really wants one with Norway and Denmark. Mm, and okay. I don't think Denmark and Norway are as keen. Or uh, a better example, the Finns, I think, are quite tired of being our buffered zone against Russia. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I see it. I don't know a lot about the uh, military uh, deals. So, but But it sounds, I mean... Plausible. Yeah, no, I'm just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, when we, when when Denmark as a country buys something, you know, quite large military-wise or otherwise, you know, it's always if if we buy something like our trains from some Italian company, you just know that we're gonna get screwed over. I mean, it's but it seems like in that respect, I I feel that. Uh, the idea of the Swedes are that they're very trustworthy. Hmm. That's a f- pretty nice stereotype to have, mm. I guess. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, so w- we go back to the sketch. Yeah. And you said at the end of your show that mm-hmm. uh, you wanted Sweden to really wake up and yeah. to unite uh, with Denmark mm-hmm. to retake what Melbourne. you... Yeah, I don't know what... Uh, what that is, uh, the the area that we call Ramallah of the North. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, how? <laughs> I mean, considering your lack of military experience. <laughs> yeah. How is that gonna uh, go down? Yes. That's what you're asking me. I have I have no idea. <laughs> and there there was another example you took up in the show, which was this uh, court ruling in a Swedish court where. Uh, um, oh, a yeah. woman had reported her man uh, uh, for abusing her, mm-hmm. and and uh, physically, uh, yes, yeah, uh, and then um, and then uh, the man got freed, mm-hmm. and she didn't. I mean, yeah, and she was sent back to him with the words that you know, uh, it's because uh, his it, family is better than her family, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was pretty crazy. How so? I mean, are you denying that his family was better than her family? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. I think if I can, if I can, uh, you know, just start in another place. I think I, you know, I was we we born in the same year. I was born in seventy eight, and um, I think growing up uh, after eighty nine. 
when like the wall was torn down, mm-hmm. there was like the, there was ten, eleven years where I just I seriously thought that you know everybody in the world was heading the same way. Yeah, everybody wanted democracy. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know, was on that path. We were just we were different places uh, in the in sort of like the evolvement and like the top point the point that we were all striving for was like the Scandinavian Belfair's model you know yeah that was like and even the US that had like a totally different system they were gonna get there you know at some point they would realize no you need a a bigger state you need uh, you know more healthcare for and, and paid schools and all this stuff. I, I, I sincerely thought that growing up. Um, but we grow, we grew, both grew up yeah. in societies that are huge welfare states. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and yeah, they tell course. us all the time that yeah, this is the this best, is the best thing way ever. to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is, and, and, and I seriously, I, I really believed that, that. That this was like just a matter of time before everybody, of course, realized that this was the right way to live. And I don't see it that way anymore. Now I see that people want really different things. And, and that uh, court ruling is a perfect example of that. That, that it's, not about, it's not about that if you get a little bit of education and a little bit of safety um, and a little bit of wealth, that then some you know, Democrat is going to grow out of your head. It doesn't work like that. I mean, we really want different things. Um, and then maybe you should have a system that accommodates for that. Yeah, at least at least you have to, at the very least, you have to realize that that people are different and want very have very different ideals about what a society should be. Uh, and if you can't even talk about that, then I think we're pretty fucked. But can you talk about that in Denmark, for instance? Um, it's it's hard because um, the way the debate is, um, people go into uh, extremes. So we have we have a lot of people who are like just trying to be tough on immigration without any thought about how are we going to get these people to feel at home in Denmark, which is as important. I mean, and it's just about, it's just about being tough and being perceived as uh, tough because uh, there's of course a lot of votes in that. And then we have uh, a diminishing uh, fraction of uh, political parties who are like insisting that that there is no problems. And um, so you have a similar situation yeah. to Sweden, but uh, but sort of toned down and people can say a bit more here than I mean, yeah. because in Sweden, as you said, you get shamed out of the public sphere if you Yeah, but I mean, the, 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 the big problem, I, as I see it, if one of the problems is that you have uh, isolated uh, Sveriges Demokraterna. Um, the, the Swedish Nationalist Party. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and we have uh, sort of you know we have had Dansk Folkeparti, which is our nationalists, for uh, a lot longer, and they are actually part of the democratic process, which has I mean they're still not in government, which I think is a problem because they're still able to sit sort of on the sideline and say oh this is not how we would have done it mm-hmm. I mean and. It's just a parody because, I mean, it's like sitting in the living room, shouting out into the kitchen what you want people. Oh, this is not how I would have made it. Mm-hmm. You know, so get out there and, you know, pull your sleeves off and, and do some stuff. Because it, I think that's the only way to see that the nationalists, what they do is they point out very real problems but their solutions are often very bad. Uh, and you don't see that unless you get them 
into doing the actual governing work. Yeah, you want them to rule so they can fail, basically. Yeah. Yes. yeah. As most people do at everything. Yeah. Yes, once given the chance at least. Yeah, and I mean, not just so they can fail, but so they can arrive into reality with the rest of us. I mean... But are the rest of the parties that are denying the problems, are they in reality? No, they are not. So we have a problem on both sides. Yeah, we have pro- definitely yeah. a problem on both sides. Um, we need uh, we need the big uh, middle of the of a the centrist political. revolution. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so too, actually. But um, so um, you've um, looked to Sweden somewhat. I mean, it must seem even crazier where we are. Yeah, definitely. How so? Please be honest. Um, it just. It just seems like, I mean, when you have a court ruling like that, and, and like the, 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 the debate that rises afterwards is like, maybe we shouldn't have a dunks man, uh, you know. You, you a sh- juror. A yeah. juror. You should just have like uh, judges that are like um, educated judges instead of, it. I mean, then you're totally missing the point. No, they're, they're actually trying to avoid the point. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> because the point is that we had two jurors mm-hmm. that were Islamists and yes. had gotten into the jury system through yeah. a political party because it's the political party that nominates jurors mm. in Sweden. Mm. So, <laughs> and then when this came to light, then, you know, instead of talking about the real problem, because yeah. Swedes are really, we're really bad at talking about yeah. real problems. We want to talk about something else because it's, especially this one, this is about Islam and we're very yeah, insecure yeah. about this. And I wanted to ask you about that because I've always gotten the impression from you Danes that you know more of what you are. In, in Sweden, it's a part of the national identity, at least since around circa 1946, mm-hmm. to deny that there is a Swedish national yeah, identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, we had but that, you don't deny yeah, that. We don't deny it in the same way, no, but, but we have that discussion as well. I mean, I've, I've seen people, you know, um, very much talk about, but what is Danish culture? Because it is sort of a, uh, a hard um, thing to talk about, because... Uh, I think we should talk a lot more about um, actual, you know, law. What is the law? The law of the land is that you have equal rights for men and women. I mean, that's like, instead of talking all, you know, all the time, it's about these Danish values. That's a lot of the discussion. Oh, this is a Danish value. But when uh, you say equal rights for men and women, you mm-hmm. mean uh, that women should have a bit more rights? than men, right? No, I don't mean that, no. It sounds like you haven't been gender mainstream yeah, yet. Yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> that's, another, that's another issue. Uh, uh, no, we'll get back to that, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's get back to that, yeah. Because um, I just, I mean, that it gets very fluffy once you talk about the Danish values, because then starts the whole discussion, well, what is the Danish value? I mean, democracy, that was made in, uh, you know, in the old Gre- Gre- Greece, you know, uh, in Athens. I mean, it's, it's but, but that doesn't hygge. mean that it's not a Danish value. Hygge. Hygge, yeah. That's hygge a is a Danish value, value because yeah. I, I arrived at the airport, the first thing I see is buy this book about Hygge. Uh, Seriously? Uh, yeah. We have a book now? Yeah, it's a book about Hygge. And I was like, what is Hygge? Yeah. If, and, and, and the poster said, if you want to know about Denmark, you've got to understand Hygge. And yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I don't know what Hygge is. So I pick up the You book don't have Hygge? Oh, I don't, probably have it. Uh, probably, but I'm not a Hygge yeah. person, I've realized after reading the back of the book. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> it's basically mys. Cuddling. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Being, yeah. being yeah. like... Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's because of the weather. You know, there's so much bad weather. And, and you know, historically we had like these houses with little tiny windows so they wouldn't get much coal in. <laughs> and then you had to call it something nice that you were just freezing and sitting close together. Okay. <laughs> and then you're like, this is Hugo. <laughs> you know? And I also think that alcohol is a big part of Hugo. Um, because we don't have any occasion in Denmark where we don't have like uh, a beer. No, I've noticed. Yeah. I don't even drink beer, which is a problem in Sweden. In this country, it would be it impossible. Would be social suicide. Uh, yes, and I, uh, and that's uh, one of the problems because I wanted to come here as soon as I I, I landed. I started hearing. Uh, the 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 song uh, I've been looking for freedom playing on repeat in my head mm-hmm. uh, because that's how it feels when you come from Sweden Denmark <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and and I was like, maybe I should apply for political asylum here. Mm, yeah. But then now I understand. I I could never become part of the Danish norm. No. Because no. I don't like huddling together with people and drinking beer. Oh, okay. <laughs> then you're screwed, yes. basically. Yeah, yeah. That is the true Danish value. Those two. <laughs> All right. I see. So let's... we actually have a, a name for if you if you fail at something. It's called a kvai buyer. It's like a failure beer. Okay. <laughs> That's like it. I mean, if you try to build like a you know a, a window, and you smash all the glass, people, if they were not too angry, could say to you, "You need a failure beer." That's a very very nice concept. I've never we we don't have anything like it in Sweden. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We just go back to our ab- abject life of complete <laughs> failure. Uh, but uh, so let's move back a bit because yeah. I wanted to talk to you about feminism because I, I yes. tried for several times to see a clip with you where you interview two... The feminists. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you start stripping. Yeah, yeah. In the clip with yes. the feminists, yeah. I mean, you couldn't do that in Sweden. If you did that in Sweden, if a, a, if a male comedian tried to make a joke about a, a female, reg- regardless how stupid this person is, yeah. regardless of their sex, okay. uh, you would be censored, shamed out of the uh, public sphere. Okay. Away with that's, you. That's a problem. Because you're in a power position as mm. a cis white male. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she's not in her pink laced boots no. uh, and okay. twerking. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should yeah, explain, explain the the, yeah. the context. Uh, there is like a <clears throat> this uh, a, a new movement of feminism in Denmark. It's like, like the fourth wave of feminism. They call themselves, and um, they are actually the fight is good. I think. I mean, they're fighting for the right to you know um, show off your body. Without anyone calling you a whore. Yes. Which I think is fair. I mean, that should well, be... But the thing is that um, that uh, it, it's sometimes it's hard for me, personally, to listen and understand uh, all the academia of uh, feminism, modern feminism. And at least if I look at twerking at the same time, it gets very complicated for me to focus. Yes. I, and and yeah. <laughs> that was like, uh, I've seen a couple of interviews with these uh, feminists and they they want this uh, respect for their intellect, but they want to insist at the same time to be very uh, sexually provocative. And... Um, and that's it's it's hard to criticize, as you also say that you're in a power position. How can you, you know? So instead of pointing fingers and saying you're doing this and this is crazy, you know, I try to just do the same, and you know, to show the point being that it is hard to focus uh, on intellectual thoughts. While looking at a semi-naked body. Well, yes, but for different reasons when you strip, I mean, compared to when these girls that you interviewed strip. Why? Well, because... I'm a 60 man. I don't know. I don't know how to bring this up with you, but I mean... (laughs) 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 Let's just say you wouldn't make it it, it, as a qualifying contender in Paradise Hotel. Okay. (laughs) Fair fair and square. (laughs) Yes. Um, I can live with that. (laughs) Yes, but I, I'm I'm quite worried about this because I mean, for you, it's easy to sit here in Denmark uh, in safety in a free country where you can drink beer and shoot people whenever you want to. <laughs> you said it was the Texas, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah of Scandinavia, mm-hmm. and and I'm in a foxhole, yeah, across from you know the the feminist shoot um, uh, you, you understand the front line. I'm on the front line, line of this okay. war, yeah. and it's. Okay. I mean, Sweden is ground zero for this type of shit. Yeah, and but ta- how, how how is this? How how are you viewed in Sweden? Um, well, I I guess um, uh, are either you like I'm an evil white man. Absolutely, and also Jewish. So I mean, there's that, and. Uh, <laughs> 
okay. but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I was uh, ignored for a long time. Okay. Even though I've, I've done quite a lot as a comedian. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been ignored for a long time. Now, uh, and then uh, when I started with Crush Socialism, they came at me first for being a nationalist, which okay. didn't really stick. Yeah. So they moved on to racist, which didn't really stick. No. They moved on to anti-Semite, which really didn't stick. No, that's another one. <laughs> Uh, and now I think I'm, uh, and then it was rapist for a while, and now seriously, yes, sure. But and but how? Like you mentally rape people or what? Yeah, I hope so with my comedy. And that's okay. I actually, you know, but most, not like a real. Uh, no, 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 oh, no, okay. no, 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 oh. no. I, I think that would be morally wrong. But maybe okay. that's just me. I don't mm. know how you do it here, down no. in the free country of Denmark. Mm -hmm. And then now I'm an incel. You at what? An incel. What does that mean? It means involuntary celibate. It means someone who doesn't get laid. Oh. Yes, it's the it's the new black in Sweden oh. call, calling your political Incel. opponents incels. Yes, which oh. is a I don't know if it's a step up or step down from rapist, but uh, <laughs> no, I don't know either. Wow. But they are conflicting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I and, and the problem I see, because we had this fourth wave, as they call it here, of feminism okay. in Sweden, we've had it for quite some time, a few okay. years now. Yeah. And I, I, the problem is this, it's an authoritarian system of belief, yes. because yes. they want to control your reaction to mm. what they are doing. Yeah. And they can, to a certain extent, control your reaction by, for instance, covering themselves up with burqas, which would give you uh, a different reaction to them mm. than when they wear Sexy lingerie. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the signals matter. I, I don't dispute that. But, but the fact that they want you to react to them when they're dressed as uh, sexual beings mm -hmm. uh, in a non-sexual way, mm -hmm. I think that is, uh, well, it's heading in the direction of fascism. And in Sweden, it's been going on for so long, so we're already there. I, I, I totally see it. I mean, it's. Uh, I think. I think there's a, another problem with the whole. Um, no, let's just let's just stay on the topic. I mean, I think it's hard when you try to control what other people should think, and and we had the same with a couple of award shows here in Denmark where people were supposed to dress in a certain way. Everybody should wear black because of the Me Too movement. And it was, I mean, it was never set out officially. Hey, th there's a dress code for this event. You know, it was just something that you were supposed to, and there were like Facebook groups that said, this is what we're gonna do, and you're gonna wear this pin. And, and it's, I think it's sort of scary because of course, when you stage stuff like that, you, you, you're convinced that you're fighting the good fight. I mean, so we're gonna all wear this thing and do this thing and sign this petition, but we're gonna do it because it's the right thing to do. But it's, you know... So you had me too in Denmark. Yeah, yeah, but it hasn't really had the effect that it had in other countries. It's interesting because uh, there was this one guy, Peter Olbeck, uh, who's a movie producer, and uh, it had very real consequences for him. but. Apart from that, not a lot happened. Um, there was a lot of focus on the arts, uh, actors, guild, uh, directors. Um. Funny that, isn't it? How the only business sectors that sell on sex were the ones most, you know, yeah. me too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and what what was really striking was that you know. Um, Women who are in other jobs, in, you know, uh, factories somewhere, you know, it's like, that's not as interesting. That someone is uh, groping an employee uh, in the back of a restaurant somewhere, mm, not very interesting story. And in that way, I think the movement, at least in Denmark, was very much driven by, driven by the journalists. And that's another funny point is that no journalists were ever accused. I mean, there's so many stories, I mean, from new newspapers and TV stations, but none of those really got anywhere. 
I mean, nobody wanted to shit in their own home. Which is uh, rather strange, because, I mean, where do you prefer to shit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not Definitely. in a bathroom stall mm -mm. out on town, right? You want no. to shit in your own home. Yeah. But then again, that's probably what makes a comedian. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to ask you a few historical questions. Yes. Do you know how many wars there's been between Sweden and Denmark? I have no idea, but a lot. Yeah. Uh, I can, I, can I guess? Yeah, sure. I would say 15. Okay, you're pretty close. I thought it was going to be like three or something, but it turns out it's between seven and 13, depending on how you count. Oh, okay. Yes. And according to Swedish Wikipedia, you started most of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that. So I want to talk to you about your king, Christian. We don't have a king. Not anymore, but no, you used okay. to have a yeah, king okay. called Christian. Yes. We call him Christian Tyrant. Tyrant, yeah. That was the, the bloodbath of uh, Stockholm. Stockholm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. that guy. Him, precisely. Mm, yeah. Because I haven't forgotten or forgiven. No, no, okay, no. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yes, it was, uh, my family wasn't even in Sweden at the time, but... Uh, Is it too late for me to apologize? No, you, one can always apologize. I'm, I'm sorry collectively. for what we, what we did. But I'm, not, I'm, I'm here for the martial help. Okay. Just, yeah, yeah, because yeah, I to... heard that here in Denmark, you call him, Christian, the good one. <laughs> I, I don't think that is true. I think he probably has a number. Most of the Christians have like a, a number. I don't, I don't remember hearing about a Christian, the good one. No? No. Okay. Cause I think we have Christian the fourth. He left the economy in ruins, but made so many buildings. So that's like the guy we really remember. Plus, he got his eyes shut out. All right. So that's like the closest to a good one. But I don't think Christian the Fourth. He can't be the one with the, the bloodbath of Sweden. Well, I I don't know if this was the fourth. This I, this might have been the second. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and um, the funny thing is, I thought I knew a lot about history, uh, but. I haven't learned that much history in school in Sweden. Mm. We don't really look back. How is it here? I don't know. I mean, it's so many years since I was in school. I don't remember what we learned. Really? Hmm. I mean... Okay, good. Then, I mean, it might not be the Swedish school system. Because in Sweden, I, I get this feeling that the government really doesn't want... Want you to look back? No, they don't want us no. to learn too much about history. No, that's strange. No, there are a few things strange uh, about Sweden, and I wanted to know that about uh, how different is Denmark. I mean, you have a, uh, a pretty much a daily show on Danish state television. Are mm -hmm. you allowed? What are you allowed to say? Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't had a lot of problems actually with that. Um, I think part of the part of the explanation is that we we uh, write the show from here, from an uh, we are. Uh, uh, we, we don't produce it in the state television uh, No, you're system. a private production yeah, company. Yeah, private production company. Yeah, that was the word. Uh, and, and, and I think that helps. Uh, and then also, we have a lot of people watching. So there are a lot of people who like it. So they sort of um, accept... Uh, I mean, they, they accept that, that we have some complaints. But historically, these last... 10 years, the state television has uh, gotten more scared about uh, pissing people off. Um, because I think the social media is part of the, the explanation. I mean, in the old days, people would call in and complain about what was on TV. And there would be like some person sitting there listening. Uh, probably, probably not listening. Probably, probably just going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then some of it, few things would go up to the next level. Yeah. Somebody insisting very hard would like. I want to talk to the boss. Okay, sure. I'll get you an appointment. Something like that. And now, if if people write on Facebook that this is utter crap, this is too much. How dare you? Then it's taken more seriously, I think, because everybody can see, hey, someone is complaining, yeah. and and that has uh, made a, a, a culture of fear, I think. Um, but but we have a culture of fear where within in, Danish with, state within Danish state television, and also because uh, this year uh, Danish state television was cut by twenty percent the funding. Um, 
because of an ideological fight, basically. I mean, because uh, we have a government now, uh, which is like the uh, the right wing, uh, which is like the liberal parties. Would that be the, no, not the liberal, uh, the uh, conservative parties. Yeah, and then with support from the nationalists. So uh, basically, the conservative parties would like to just have lower taxes. Yeah, and this is a way of cutting that. And the um, and the nationalists. Uh, feel and to some extent also the conservatives that the state television is um, left wing. Well, it probably is. Yeah, to some extent it is. Not as bad as it used to be, uh, or bad. Not as much as it used to be. Uh, but uh, but of course it makes total sense that when we all pay for some television, it shouldn't be just for a, a part of. Uh, population. I mean, that seems logical, but so I think they have been afraid of criticism because they knew that this was like coming. Yeah, well, it's hard to be a public service. BBC got the same uh, flack like oh, a de- yeah. less than a decade ago, but a few years ago, and then they did a big re- uh, overhaul. And I mean, it's still a bit left biased to say mm-hmm. the least, but. They've gotten better at it, I'd yeah. say. Uh, in Sweden, we don't see the same uh, at all. Uh, now they've made it mandatory to pay for state television okay. uh, via the the tax Sex. taxes. Yeah. So you can't even try to get away from it anymore. I mean, they oh, used okay. to pretend that it was optional. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. then they hunted you down if you didn't pay. Mm. Um, it's and, same in Denmark. And, uh, now they moved it to the taxes also. Yeah, and I think because uh, they realize also uh, from a business perspective, they're losing all the young viewers. Yeah. So the only way to finance this in the future will be the, via With the taxes tax. if yeah. you want to finance it. Yeah. And obviously they do. But I mean, in Sweden, it's a big problem. I, I made a, a web series mm-hmm. kind of like your show, but shorter episodes yeah. on yeah. Swedish state television for three seasons. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to fight pretty much for i mean any joke aimed at the right okay they just flew through no okay. one complained yeah okay and every joke aimed at the left the feminists islamists or environmentalists were just cut out Seriously? and for every joke every episode okay. every season ah, okay so we yes. have uh, quite a problem, I would say. Yeah. And, and it's not like I tried to provoke them. I no, just no. tried to, you know, tell the truth and add punchlines. Mm-hmm. Basically, that's all yeah. I do. Yeah. Uh, and um, as best I can. Sometimes mm. I'm wrong. Sometimes, yeah. you know, it just happens. Course, yeah. And then, uh, so that really, because I got a, there was a documentary film team who interviewed me like a year ago. And, and they asked me what radicalized me, because that's how most Swedes now apparently view me as okay. a radical yeah. person. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, actually, I was radicalized inside SVT. <laughs> yeah. So okay. if you want to see me as a radical, I don't really see me as a radical. No, no. I mean, from my perspective, I think technology is just a, a driving force for most things. And uh, the information monopoly that our governments used mm. to have, yeah. I mean, it's breaking up. Yeah, it's breaking up. Of course it, it is. And it has very little to do with politics. I mean, it, it gets into politics, but mm. it has to do with technology. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. But I think there's a, I mean, there's a larger structural problem uh, here also, because I used to manage a, a theater here in Copenhagen. Um, and one of the things that happened in these years, those years, uh, that was back in 07, was that uh, you started to get a lot more information about the people who bought tickets. And it became clear that it was the same people. You know, it was people from uh, uh, Copenhagen and north of Copenhagen, which is like the people who uh, have the most money. You know, nobody living in the southern suburbs of Copenhagen bought theater tickets. And you you sort of had an idea that it was like that, but you didn't have any uh, hardcore proof of it before these new ticket systems, systems yeah. you know, because of uh, technology, you, at, at some point you could see, okay, you can actually see which streets, where do they come from, these people who buy this. And of course, it's a problem that we all pay 
for this, and it's the uh, people who have the most money mm-hmm. who use it. Yeah. I mean, of course, that's going to break down. Yeah. Of course, people are going to, you know, once this gets out, people are going to be, I'm not going to pay for that. Because it's terribly unfair. It's terribly unfair. And if uh, that was like one of the big discussions we had in those years was that if we don't, as uh, theater producers, uh, think about this and try with all we got to change this, to get other people in and give them an experience, then we're doomed. I mean, because no one's going to pay for this in the long run. Nobody's going to give like uh, financial aid to the rich. No, it does. Well, you said it and I was prepared to completely agree with you. And then I started thinking about banking (laughs) bailout. Of course. So, But that's not going to happen the next time. We're not going to bail them out again. Maybe in Denmark. I'm not too sure about Swedes. <laughs> I don't know what it would take for Swedes to rebel. You know, have you ever had a revolt here? No, we haven't. Neither have Sweden. No. It's kind of weird, isn't yeah, it? it is. It is. At yeah. least you were occupied. I mean, at least someone, you know, and, and you put up but sort of did, a fight. No, we didn't. But yes, we sort didn't. of. No. You want to hear an old Norwegian joke for, from the 40s? Yeah. Okay, so the joke is this. Uh, the Germans, it took them two days to take Copenhagen, mm-hmm. two weeks to take Norway, and one phone call to take Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, because it's true. Yeah, maybe. But I mean, we, we, did, I mean, we did a lot of shit. Do you know that when we were occupied, we just, the communists who were in parliament, they were just put in jail. And Parliament kept working. Well, they were communists. I don't really. This is this is due to you not being gender mainstreamed enough. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather actually came from Denmark to Sweden. He okay. was a German Jew. He escaped from Dachau in thirty nine to Denmark, and then he came over with the Danish Jews in forty three, uh-huh. I think, to Sweden. Wow. So, uh, and I mean, you were quite good to your yeah. Yeah, we've always been good to exporting. To Sweden, like that. <laughs> yeah, a, a, well, a certain extent, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, back to the core issue now, which is uh, the martial help you offered. Okay. Because I came here, th- I, I'm here for less than 24 hours, and yeah. I have to get back soon, mm-hmm. lest they impose Sharia law in Sweden. Yeah. That's your joke. I'm it's, stealing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it could happen. It could happen. It, I, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, actually. But, and, and, and I want to. I really want to know. Mm-hmm. How can I save Sweden? I'm giving I, you a I direct mean, line yeah. to my messiah complex. Yeah, here. I know, I know. Uh, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really quite... Um, I think maybe it's easier in some way to be a comedian from the outside talking about Sweden. I talked to a few uh, Swedish comedians about this. Um, I, I did a, uh, with a colleague of mine uh, called Jan Ginberg, we, we did a, uh, like a special about uh, humor in Sweden. And, and that was we, a short special. <laughs> <laughs> it, was actually, it was actually very interesting because we talked to some Swedish comedian and, and talked about jokes. And then I remember, I think it was Fride Fritzson, you know? Him? Yes. Yeah. And he said, and we said, is this funny in Sweden? And he he said, it's funny if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and that's so uh, you know, maybe maybe you, Sweden needs someone from the outside saying this because I think I think it's very sad what's happening. Uh, that when you tell me that you're like viewed as a I don't even remember what the last word was. Incel. Incel. That's it. That's it. I mean, it just seems so harsh. My my, my girlfriend was quite surprised. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's it's, that's good. <laughs> yes. it would be bad if she was like, "Yeah, I told you." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So so I think maybe it's easier to, but also it's it's hard for me to quite understand what um what the effect is in in. I mean, who are these people who are sharing the 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 sketch that uh, we did? 
you know, um, I, I try to follow. Uh, I think your on, sketch actually yeah. was hugely popular in Sweden, and it wasn't popular just, just with ju- the no, no, not just with the right wing. No, it was popular because you made a parody of one of the most popular TV dramas in mm. Swedish and Danish current TV history. Mm. Uh, partly because of that, and partly because you know Swedes do have prejudice against Danes. Yeah. We do think you're more direct and backwards, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and a bit more conservative, maybe, and racist and sexist, and, yeah, and all, all that. that. So when you come to Sweden, Fritte Fritzson is like, they already think you're sexist. Go ahead, <laughs> Go do the jokes. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And at the same time, I mean, you obviously see us, and I think there's, you know, some truth to the cliches and stereotypes mm. that we comedians actually work with because they're out there in the collective consciousness. But right? don't you think it's strange that there is no more uh, exchange? Yeah, exchange, yeah. I Extremely mean, weird. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you music, why. There is so much. We listen to so much Swedish music, and, and I think also we export some. I think you do, yeah. Although. I can't really remember. Murray, maybe? Or Lucas Graham? No, I oh. remember the Barbie doll. Oh, Aqua. Yes, yeah, my favorite that's, band. That's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yes. bet. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, but I mean, it's just, it's strange that, I mean... Because Norway and Sweden has a quite a big exchange. Oh, you do? Yes, uh, when it comes to comedians. Okay. I've been to Norway plenty of times. We've had Norwegian comedians coming over to okay. us. Yeah. Same with Finland. Okay. But Denmark, Sweden, nothing. Nothing, no. I mean, and, and I got the impression that uh, it's because you have a sense of humor. So, so that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I think we should make like a summit. I mean, like a, a Scandinavian humor summit. Yeah, it would well, be nice. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you could, you know, help us Swedes. Because I've, I've been around for a while as a comedian mm-hmm. in, in Scandinavia, and I'll tell you, uh, I think Finns have the darkest sense of humor. Okay, yeah. I mean, the real Finns. I mean, not the party, the real Finns. I mean, the ethnic Finns and not yeah. the Swedish Finns. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The Swedish Finns are just as boring or even slightly more boring than the Swedes. Okay. Because Swedes are extremely anxious and nervous. They don't like to laugh. I mean, most foreign comedians that I've uh, toured with in Sweden... They go like, the room was completely silent. Oh. They hated me. And I'm like, no, no you got no, a warm is... reception. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, that, the, but, can't but, you tell the difference between silence and silence? Mm, I mean, this was a good silence. This was good silence. Yeah. But, but, and Nor- ha- Norwegians are also more boisterous. They laugh more. They're mm. more direct. They're more uh, uh, conflict-seeking. Yeah, uh, yeah. Swedes are very conformist and consensus-seeking. Mm. So it's when, when you joke in Sweden, the best comedians or... N- I wouldn't say the best, the, the, the biggest comedians. They do jokes that are cohesive. Yeah. Uh, so uh, they only do jokes that everyone can already agree with. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I think that's the same in, in a lot of places. I mean, the, to a certain, to I mean, a certain extent. Diff- yeah. but, but what happens to the, 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 the choices of topic in comedy? I mean, when you have like the... Like so much political correctness. I mean, you have the the PK mafia. Uh, it, yes, PC uh, mafia in English. PC yeah. mafia uh, breathing down your back. I mean, what happens? What what becomes the topics that comedians choose? Well, in Sweden, most comedians just joke about you know uh, everyday stuff that isn't offensive. Like really, that's. So like, that's uh, where it's at. I mean, if, I you're, if you're a girl with... and, or uh, even a girl with the immigrant. Uh, background, mm. you can joke about almost anything, yeah, of, of course. course. Yeah. But uh, if you're a white male, you cannot. No. So, th- and, and but I've gone the other way, and I knew before I even got into stand up what type of comedy and texts I wanted to produce in life, yeah. which is also always contrarian in nature. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. But I mean, that's also in the in the uh, DNA of the comedian as a archetype. I mean, is to talk about the stuff that is. Uh, conflict stuff or the stuff that you're not supposed to say I mean that's that's in the nature of being a comedian I think uh, no I agree but I think Swedes don't really see it that way they have a real problem with uh, people who think differently mm. it's it's almost a crime in Sweden but isn't it also it's a social crime at least yeah but isn't it also I mean humor also feeds on the fact that there are taboos yes So to some extent, it must also uh, revitalize uh, comedy. Well, 
I thought so. I thought, I mean, when I looked at it, when I was younger, before I even started with stand-up, uh, I was like, I mean, this is a virgin market. I can just go in and do mm. shock value one-liners and I'll mm. be king. Mm. Um, but then I started, like six months after I started and had won this competition, I started joking about narcotics. Mm -hmm. D nothing really hard, just no. like smoking marijuana jokes. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. was l like less than 10 years ago. So, and I was pretty much the first comedian in Sweden to do that on stage. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the room for the first three years just fell completely silent. It did? Yeah, and okay. I could I could have joked, I could have had five five really solid Fritzl jokes to start off. And they would laugh, you know, pedophilia, okay. who doesn't like it. Uh, but then move into cannabis and people and like, ah, okay. oh, interesting. That, you just cross the line, buddy. Yeah, okay. um, uh, and we have a lot of these taboos. And, uh, and I've noticed that if you're going to talk about taboos, there has to be an acceptance, acceptance in culture that it is okay to have a different opinion. Yeah, and we don't really have that. So what happens is you get booked less and less, and you okay. get frozen out, and, yeah, then, yeah. and then you're basically just chummed. And, uh, yeah, and how are you going to reach out then? Yeah, then and then you're going to become YouTube like a niche with like a, a niche comedian. Well, I, I never wanted to be mainstream. I always wanted to be mm. a niche comedian, but I wanted to be able to support myself of on course. my niche comedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, in Sweden you have the culture against you, you have the PC mafia against you, mm. you have the state. Uh, subsidies to culture against you uh, because they won't give the subsidies to you they give it to your competition which yeah. might be lovely uh, theater yeah, yeah. or song or whatever but it creates an effect where i have to compete on real market terms with people who basically just are given money for whatever yeah yeah so uh, and in sweden i mean all the cultural subsidies they're very clear they they should go to uh, women uh, who yeah. do things about gender or immigrants who do things about being an immigrant yeah uh, not jews about being jewish because uh, no. in that case i would have been given money yeah. but i wasn't so uh, i mean we have this i i would say it's a form of government discrimination basically yeah I can I can see that it's it's an the idea is that it has to be about something quote unquote important, right? Yes. I mean, but I agree. Well, I agree to the extent that I think that an artist should always do what's important to the artist. Yeah. yeah. And in some cases, that is actually important to other people. In which case, he will be recognized or she. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see that, but. Uh, Um, the thing that I oppose is the idea of something being obje objectively important. These are the important issues. These are the issues that should be addressed in comedy. Well, I, 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 I agree. I, I don't think there are shoulds no. per se, but I mean, there are things that yeah, are I, important I, I can, to people, like yeah, yeah, marriage, totally, birth, death. I totally understand. Yeah. I totally understand what you mean. It's just it's something that I think that Danish television has uh, has suffered because of is this idea of, um, you know, we talked about Brun earlier, yeah. the, the bridge. And a lot of these uh, Nordic Noir uh, drama series in Danish television um, always have to be about something important. I mean, it's about the, the, the latest one that, that ran was about um, aid in Africa. And the one before that was about uh, a priest Um, losing his faith it was about faith everything was about what you believe in um, and it sort of feels like in a way going back to school you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's like it's not it, fun no it's not really I mean I can't feel that there's an artist somewhere who's like you know this is the story about my father yeah. you know building his bicycle shop whatever I mean, I can't feel that anyone is actually passionate about this. I, I can see that it's a way to sell something. This is, this is about belief. What do you believe in? This is important today because we have a lot of uh, new citizens here who have a different uh, opinion about God and we have sort of thrown God away and now we have to find out 
if we, uh, you know, should reinvent ourselves as a religious people. So I can see the whole, you know, the whiteboard with all the interesting thoughts, but I don't see any passion in it. I mean, so it's like, mm, this is, this is what I've, what I've, what I talk about when I talk about like objectively uh, important important things. This is important. This is the important issue. And I mean, I think that is um, totally a, 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 a wrong way to, to view uh, both art and entertainment. How would you solve the problem? Um, when, when we do the show, we, we talk about what kind of news... Uh, there's, of course, maybe one story every week that would be strange if we didn't address it. But it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like huge. We can choose, uh, I think it's important, and we, we talk a lot about this, that, that we choose the news that's important this week. I mean, it's not, it's not, um, it's not uh, important that this was the biggest stories of the week. It's important that we feel passionate about these stories, that we feel that we have something to say about this. I mean, because otherwise we would have been talking about Peter Mason and Kimbal every week and we never addressed that because also it's not, for me it wasn't, in any form or shape, uh, comedy material. But that's what's been filling up the news. Let's uh, just back up the tape there a minute. Okay. So, uh, uh, a billionaire who builds his own submarine mm -hmm. kills a Swedish journalist mm -hmm. underwater. Yeah. And you can't find comedy in that? Yeah, sure I can. But <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if you had read about this story in Africa, if you were an African person reading about this, yeah, yeah. as a small, it's just a small piece of the paper. You just read about yeah, crazy yeah, yeah, billionaire yeah, builds course. submarine, yeah, kills yeah. journalist underwater. I didn't know he was a billionaire, was he? No, I don't know. I don't he know. was a millionaire. But he was something. He, yeah, he yeah. could afford to build his own submarine. Yeah, he could. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, um, I, at least I wasn't able to do it in a way that I would feel was um, in... No, but I understand. I mean, I mean, the trial is going on, yeah. and it's a big and tragedy. Also, it's and also, just, it's just the way that the quote-unquote serious media would just keep making you know, new articles about this thing. That there was no more reporting to do. Yeah. I mean, there was nothing. They, in some of the serious newspapers, uh, they were even more uh, hypocrites because they had like fiction writers and you know following the trial just to try and get a new i mean they were it was like you could see the meeting where they were just like we need a new submarine story yeah tomorrow what can we do with this at least the tabloid uh, newspapers were more honest they were just like okay so now he said this and <laughs> you know it's just but uh, i think i just I personally got to a point where I was just like, I, 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 I because they I were reveling in it. Yeah, it was and they disgusting. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and I felt the same about Fritzel. That's why I made the Fritzel jokes. Yeah. Those were my first jokes. I was like, this is a personal tragedy, and for some reason, the entire world is reading about nothing else. Yeah. So yeah, but then again, I'm not from Austria, so I just shut my heart and wrote those jokes. Yeah. <laughs> And and that's also I mean that that's also I think a, a valid point that it's also about the distance geographically. Yeah. I mean, so sure, as an African comedian, I would probably have viewed it differently. I I, I think absolutely. I mean, a hundred thousand Swedes die in a tsunami in Sweden. That's not very funny. No. But in South America, it's pretty hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stupid Swedes dying in tsunamis. Um, yes, <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to ask uh, as a final question uh, okay. about the cartoons of Muhammad yeah, that yeah. Uh, your country did, because yeah. this is sort of a important point. In Sweden, we're, we can't discuss these issues at all. Okay. Uh, but uh, you had this uh, paper, Jyllands Posten, right? Yes. 
and they uh, wanted to find out if anyone would draw Muhammad. Mm-hmm. And uh, they put out an ad. Can anyone? Uh, is there a graphic illustrator? Anyone yeah. who can do this? And mm-hmm. they got a lot of responses. And then your country uh, got into kind of an international shitstorm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you think that that instance uh, helped you try to debate these issues more openly? Did you have a debate before this? Yes. Uh, no, not not in the same way. It, it changed a lot, I think. Uh, it's a very, very for for Danish people. This is uh, uh, this is a very um, still a very difficult uh, discussion. But um, so you haven't joked about this on your show? No, I haven't. But <laughs> no. it hasn't been really uh, no. re. Uh, what would you say? Reiterated, or uh, uh, it hasn't it has resurfaced. Been, it, ha- it hasn't resurfaced while we did the show, but um, it changed for me personally. It, it changed a lot. Uh, first, when the the drawings came out, uh, I remember seeing it and not thinking anything of it. I mean, I, I had no idea. Uh, that this would be such a controversial thing. I, I seriously didn't. Uh, so um, I think that's also the point that is hard to see uh, here afterwards because nobody knew. I mean, I've met some of the people who drew uh, the, the drawings and they had no idea. I mean, they were just like, yeah, okay, sure, I can do this. Um, and then, then when it exploded, that totally changed it because all of a sudden it was like, okay, why did they do this? I mean, and and at that point, uh, I I was on the the team that was like, there is no reason to do this. This is too much. Apparently, it's so important for uh, these people. So why would this be necessary? Um, and that changed uh, because once I thought about it it's really hard to argue anything else than then we have to support the, the freedom of speech I mean and why because what is the alternative really well let me ask you a question if you yeah. saw a Pakistani journalist wiping his ass with the Danish flag hmm. Would that uh, push you to burn down the Pakistani embassy? In no way, no. No, it wouldn't annoy you that much, would it? No, it wouldn't. Freedom of speech is important because... Because we all have to... If we all have to live together, even though we are... We view the world very different. I mean, we can't change just because some people are willing to use violence. Because that's what it is, isn't it? I mean, all the people talking about not hurting other people's feelings, it's basically because some people are willing to use violence. Because I hear this argument a lot that, of course, it's hard to, you know, come from another place and and uh, you people are looking at you in this way and thinking this and that and saying this and that about you and it's understandable that that is that that will lead some people to do uh, terrible things but then i think about all the people who are looked at in a terrible way who, who don't do that and they are more yeah because i mean what would happen if imagine this imagine that a homeless person once in a while just shut up, uh, you know, sh- uh, yeah, shoot. shoot up a cafe of people shouting, you all have homes. <laughs> we would seriously start treating homeless people better. You think? Yeah. I think we would, we would wake up and say, oh my God, yeah, I see it now. They don't even have a home. What were we thinking? And that's why violence works. It does, but I mean... As you said, most homeless people don't shoot at cafes. And I don't think we should, you know, uh, uh, push that as a prejudice against homeless people. No, no, no. No. Definitely not. (laughs) Definitely not. Shouldn't give any good ideas. (laughs) Actually, I think, you know, um, 
if you have a few crowns as a homeless person, you probably prefer to spend it on drugs or food rather than pistols and yeah. bullets. Yeah. Because so. pistols and bullets are, you know, expensive. Mm, very. And also don't get you high. No. No. True. Yes. So I want to thank you anyway for letting well, me... Uh, thank you for coming. I, I hope that... Uh, no, I was so upset uh, when they brought you out in Opinion Live in Swedish television. And just at the, at the end of the show... <laughs> Uh, yeah. And you weren't allowed to speak, and they cut you off. And and, and like we have issues with Skype, okay? But I I do Skype interviews from my fucking living room, and mm. no one complains, and they go on for hours. So yeah. so I mean, it's <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm very sorry on behalf of uh, no problem. my native country. I, I was I was very happy to to do it because it made a great. Um, segment in uh, the show <laughs> all right thank you, uh, thank you. anyway Jonathan Spam thank you for having me Thank you for listening to Deconstructive Criticism, or in Swedish, Dekonstruktiv Kritik, with this episode's guest, Jonathan Spang. Links to his Twitter, as well as the sketches that became viral, can be found on my webpage, www.aronflam.com, where you can also buy t-shirts, read articles, and listen to other episodes. And remember to keep a lookout for the three fantastic comedy sketches. I'm dead serious when I say that they are taken together, my magnum opus. They are also possibly the most beautiful comedy sketches ever shot. If not, then at least in the superhero parody genre. So you should keep a lookout for hashtag super therapy or hashtag superheroes in therapy because mine will break the hashtag. I know full well that it is ridiculous to put in that much time and effort into what amounts to less than 10 minutes of film, but my stupidity won out in the end and I will present to you super therapy by the end of June and it will be magnificent. It will be like seeing the Ark of the Covenant. So if you are a person who swished me for Schön or Groin, uh, my comedy special from 2015, thank you so much. The three superhero sketches I promised you, they're coming out soon, featuring the talented Joel Spira from Easy Money as a Rachnoboy, the lovely Sir Andrew Lowry, who's not a sir, nor from England, who you might remember from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the original feature film, not the TV series, playing the captain, and Mahmoud Suvakci, also from Easy Money as the Green Giant. I hope you will enjoy them. Unlike this podcast, you can share them openly without risking social suicide. And hopefully, this will remind my colleagues that I'm still a comedian, while they are still political activists paid by the state. And if you don't support this podcast, but you want to, you can always become a Patreon at www.patreon.com. Just search for my name, that is Aaron Flam, Aaron with one A and Flam with one M, and then you can donate as much or as little as you want, and I prefer much. So uh, the amount will only be drawn if I publish an episode, so you don't have to worry about it ticking away forever. The same goes for Swish, so if you want to Swish me, the number is 076-894-3737, 076-894-3737. And if you are a really brave person, you can go onto my website, www.aronflam.com slash merchandise, and buy a t-shirt with the message Krossa Socialismen, which means crush socialism, printed on the front, and socialism är ondska hjärta, which means socialism is evil heart emoji on the back. The heart emoji is there to remind us that we only want to crush the ideology, socialism, and not the socialists themselves. They can be cuddly, so we'll save them instead from their false Marxist consciousness uh, by buying a t-shirt, for instance. So be a capitalist hero, every purchase is a capitalist act. Just as every purchase of the blue Swedish Tiger t-shirt, buying one of those demonstrates that you are an individualist hero. And who wouldn't want to be one of those guys instead of these collectivist schmucks that's run amok in Sweden since the early 1920s? I am Aron Flam, and I intend to remain that until next time you hear from me. Thank you for listening and sharing. Have a great national day, and until next time we meet, have a good unit of time. (laughs) 